So hi everybody, you just saw my presentation, so I can just um, say uh, thank you and goodbye. Um, so um, first of all, uh, a little bit of disclaimer. So I came to this conference um, with my presentation almost ready, almost because I mean, I'm me. Uh, but uh, then after the first talk by Josh, I deleted like first four slides. And then after the rest of the talks on the first day, I deleted, I think, another five slides and was left with four slides for 30 minute presentation. Um, what I'm trying to say is so far, excellent conference. Thanks to the organizers and thanks for inviting me. I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, and a uh, good thing is that uh, by the end of the first day, I also had a draft of the rest of new 10 slides. Uh, so uh, it was very productive discussions right on the first day. So um, the first introductory slides uh, that got put in the shredder and uh, repurposed into and compressed, uh, essentially they, are, uh, they go like this. So uh, usually we all hear this uh, excellent phrase that we are coming to the age of big data in astronomy and that uh, machine learning epoch is starting now. Well, uh, really we had uh, this deluge of data for the last like 30 years, uh, the same as machine learning era, because even in the midst of the AI winter, we actively used uh, machine learning for all kinds of stuff. And uh, really early because some of those papers are older than me. So when uh, I hear uh, things about, uh, uh, we are coming to the big era data, well, come on, we are already uh, there a long time ago. Uh, but yes, in the last uh, decades, uh, we had a rapid growth of this data. Um, and for light curves, it is probably even more impressive than for simple photometry or images because observing the whole sky periodically uh, wasn't that easy. Uh, 20 years ago, and now we are routinely observing or going to be observing uh, like in the next um, couple of years, dozens of billions of variable sources with sometimes hundreds, some, sometimes even thousands of observations per object. And let's not even start on the photometric depths, on the photometric uh, sensitivity, because uh, with uh, photometric sensitivity of the state of the art uh, surveys right now, uh, most of the stars are variable, so we can detect even variability of sun-like stars, which is pretty crazy. If uh, 20 years ago, a catalog of variable stars, a big catalog uh, contained like maybe 100,000 of stars, now everything that we observe is variable. Now, fortunately, we have machine learning to deal with this. And... Um, for classification, for uh, regression tasks, we use machine learning pretty actively, but uh, the absolute majority, well, not absolute majority, but uh, noticeably uh, high percentage of uh, research is done with supervised machine learning. So if we have some data set with observed features, if we have labels, then we can use um, supervised machine learning to map these features to the labels. Unlike uh, unsupervised machine learning, where we don't have any labels and we don't need them, and we do not introduce any biases of our knowledge in our analysis, but instead we map uh, the topology of the data set and figure out what kind of substructures, what kind of clusters, what kind of manifolds we have there. So unsupervised machine learning, of course, a sort of a pipe dream for all of us, because uh, let's uh, drop all the spec, all the need for spectroscopic data, or let's uh, drop all our biases and selection biases that are introduced by some uh, high precision uh, observations. Let's just look at the data set and find out what is there. Uh, but uh, for some curious reason, uh, most of our research is done with supervised machine learning. Question why? So first of all, uh, let's uh, briefly look at what is unsupervised machine learning, what kinds of unsupervised uh, ML algorithms exist. So roughly uh, the tasks uh, for unsupervised machine learning are separated into three categories. Roughly because the separation is uh, quite kind of blurry. So first of all, we have uh, clusterization tasks. So we find separate groups of objects. Uh, this is an uh, excellent uh, illustration from uh, SkyKit uh, documentation uh, that shows how different uh, clusterization algorithms perform on different kinds of data sets. Now, um, in astronomy, we most likely, most commonly use uh, three types of this of these algorithms. It is uh, k-means and uh, a whole family of uh, extended k-means algorithms, k-medoids and so on and so forth. 
It is hierarchical DB scan that allows to search clusters within clusters. And it is uh, Gaussian mixture models, uh, which is good when you have clusters that are overlapping. Uh, that models uh, your data set as an overlap of several Gaussian clusters in multidimensional space. Um, now, if you look carefully, uh, you can uh, see that there is no algorithm that is outperforms all the rest in all of the cases. So k-means is good because it is simple. It is uh, proximity-based, but uh, proximity-based doesn't work if your data set contains some twisty and uh, wiggly uh, structure. So for example, for the first two uh, types of data sets, uh, k-means will give you garbage results. Uh, Unlike uh, dbscan, which is good at uh, mapping all the weird uh, wiggly structures, but not so good uh, when you need to separate overlapping clusters because it will uh, give you a hellish amount of subclusters with, uh, which do not have any physical meaning. Uh, and Gaussian mixtures are good when you have overlapping clusters, but it assumes Gaussian uh, distributions, which is not really true for real world. So, um, what what kind of uh, data sets we're dealing in real world with astronomy? Uh, is it overlapping clusters? Is there any Gaussianity? Is there something, some wiggly uh, round structures that uh, are weaving like a dragon in the sky? Uh, well, in reality, we have a combination of all types and even worse. And uh, generally, um, well, nature doesn't care about clusters. Uh, we have a uniform, not uniform, but continuous distributions. Um, and trying to separate them into clusters. It's uh, more or less like trying to separate elliptical galaxies and si uh, spiral galaxies. So if you have a small sample uh, observed with very low resolution telescope, that's a way to go. But once you have billions of galaxies, you discover that there is no clear separation. There is a continuum spectrum. Uh, this is where a second uh, type of algorithms um, comes to our help. Um, which is manifold mapping or uh, dimensionality reduction. There are many names to these types of algorithms, but they are all uh, working on the same principle. So uh, we try to figure out uh, what kind of structures exist in multidimensional space, and we try to put them into two-dimensional or three-dimensional map for one single reason. Uh, we are humans, and we cannot uh, perceive any information in higher dimensional space. We all go a glitch. Uh, this is the only reason why we need this um, dimensionality reduction to such small dimensions. <clears throat> I mean, it would be perfect if we had any ways to uh, really think in multidimensional space because, okay, most of our uh, great discoveries are essentially unsupervised human learning uh, of manifolds in some parameter space. Think a uh, hertzsprung russell diagram. It is a manifold on 2D space, well, really 3D because uh, we usually use scores, so we are combining two features into one feature engineering, hallelujah. Um, and uh, this simple plot, manifold, uh, well, we studied with a great success for the last 100 years, and we'll study for another 500 years, and uh, we'll be getting Nobel Prizes for this. <clears throat> so, very productive. But night nature doesn't have to work in 2D or 3D space. Uh, obviously, unless nature in the universe is very friendly towards us uh, skin and fat uh, leather um, bags, uh, there are some relations and there are some laws that make sense on the, on, in higher dimensional space. The reason why we don't see them and the reason why we do not understand them is because we are limited. So in theory, using unsupervised machine learning and uh, using uh, dimensionality reduction, we should be able to at least uh, by proxy figure out what are those laws. Um, so there is a multitude of different uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms. Most of them uh, use two basic principles. It is whether uh, objects are close to, to each other and whether they lie on some continuous shape. Uh, there are different metrics for determining proximity. So we usually think proximity as Euclidean distance. It's not always so, uh, but it's just these two principles. Now, um, this is a good example uh, of uh, using creatively using um, dimensionality reduction for variable source analysis uh, on the picture in the bottom. I think I have it in a little bit higher resolution. So um, here, uh, Armstrong and all, um, 
they used uh, self-organizing maps, which is one of the dimensionality reduction algorithms, to uh, group together uh, light curves that have similar shapes. And then they feed uh, this single parameter, the coordinate uh, on the self-organizing map of this light curve, to a random forest classifier to figure out whether uh, this single parameter, the single dimension, is enough to discern between common types of variable sources. So they used, I think, like um, four main types, uh, which was uh, detached bi binaries, um, semi-detached, uh, error lyra, and something else, and delta scuti, I think. And they figured out that even without any additional information, only by mapping the shapes of the light curves uh, on this um, self-organizing maps, they get an excellent result. They get um, over 90% uh, uh, on the confusion matrix of uh, true positive results for these main types without any additional information, without periods, without course, without anything. Now, adding just periods uh, and something I think about um, I think a scatter of the observations, there was like two or three more parameters, they improved the classification for all categories up to 90%. So bottom line, uh, even very small amount of parameters when they are uh, contain a lot of information and dimensionality reduction is excellent for this kind of task, can give you excellent classification, which helps you to discern between all the main classes. Now, um, the last type of unsupervised machine learning uh, application cases is uh, anomaly finding, so uh, detecting something that is not similar to the rest of the data sets. Now, uh, algorithms that are used for this is essentially the same as before, because most of those algorithms actually can be used in either of three modes. Plus, um, nowadays, almost all supervised machine learning algorithms can produce some kind of anom anomaly score and for example, a uh, great example of this is uh, alert brokers. I think Alerse um, has it within their pipeline produced uh, a production of an anomaly score. So essentially, when some supervised machine learning produces classification, it can also pinpoint the objects that do not fall into either of the categories. Now, um, this is also a cool example. So. Uh, um, I don't see which year it was done, I think 21. Uh, so uh, features were extracted from light curves uh, using RNNs. Uh, they were mapped onto latent space. There was no visible cluster groups or no visible uh, anomaly groups that would be pinpointed. But then they, um, this latent space and these features were uh, fed to the isolation forest, which is a modification of supervised machine learning algorithm. And indeed, uh, there was an anomaly score that helped to identify semi-regulars uh, within a group of uh, periodic variables and uh, anomalous um, um, asymptotic uh, giant branch stars plus some well-evolved stars in the, um, in the dust envelopes. So um, pretty simple approach, uh, very basic, uh, but it also gave anomaly scores routinely. Now, um, the thing about uh, all these sort of successful applications, uh, why they are so few if you can use them uh, pretty convenient? Conveniently. Uh, well, um, there was this statement uh, several years ago, which was very pretty common, is that uh, neural networks are a uh, black box. So you cannot figure out what is going on inside. Fortunately, uh, we are not there anymore. Uh, thanks to the um, advances mostly coming from industry, we uh, have great visualization tools and great uh, tools that help us to look into the inside of the, of the neural networks and figure out what each layer corresponds to. Now, unsupervised machine learning is uh, not used that commonly, so we don't have uh, this many great tools that would help us to understand what the hell those pictures are. Now, uh, this is a cool example, um, which is uh, application of the unsupervised machine learning to um, um, manifold the identification on the spectra, not on light curves, uh, low resolution Gaia XP spectra, on which we had a talk, uh, I think, on day one or day two, day one, I think. Uh, so um, the authors tried uh, a couple of uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms, TSNA and UMAPS, and they tried this on a two representation of the same data uh, on the uh, 
basis function representation, which is the default representation for the um, Gaia XP spectra, and on the classical spectra, uh, on the classical sampled spectra, so just wavelengths and flux. Now, uh, TSNA, so somewhere, yes. Uh, so on the left, TSNA wasn't very informative. Uh, because it had uh, a multitude of substructures that were pretty hard to uh, interpret. Now, UMAP uh, got better results to the authors, although uh, if you use different representation of the data, so on the second picture, there is a uh, basis function representation, and uh, on the third picture is sampled form. So it looks pretty similar, but a number of uh, small clusters that as I will show on the next slide, have physical meaning. They just disappear in one of the uh, in one of the representations. So depending on how you present your data, you get different results, which is not very convenient when you are trying to actually find something. I mean, we cannot try uh, all kinds of representations of data. That would be too much. But the fun uh, the uh, fun story started when they used the recommended uh, by the Gaia XP uh, developers truncation of the basis function. So essentially, just dropping out the basis functions that, um, well, sort of uh, supposedly do not carry much uh, information and mostly just contribute to the uh, enlarging in the level of the noise of the low resolution spectra. Now, uh, once the authors used this truncated spectra and converted them to sampled form, they got this um, this last picture uh, with some crazy uh, clusters well defined. And when they tried to understand what is the physical meaning of those clusters, it turned out that uh, they are just grouped by the number of basis functions that were left uh, in the analysis. So uh, what was supposed to be uh, not essential for the final representation turned out that unsupervised machine learning picked those technical details um, with a great quality and just use it as a main uh, separation criteria for the clusters for the objects. Now, this is um, the reason why, one of the reasons why um, using unsupervised machine learning is so hard is that it is highly technical, uh, highly sensitive to all kinds of technical nuances. You know, nuances and uh, you can pinpoint uh, some calibration issues or some instrumentation issues which are uh, probably important for the improvement for the improving the quality of your data sets but not really of science interest to you if you are trying to find some rare type of stars so uh, interpreting results like this. Uh, if with machine learning, with supervised machine learning, these algorithms are so well developed that literally more or less any astronomer can pick a random forest algorithm and apply it uh, to their data. Uh, understanding unsupervised algorithms is a hard task unless you spend some uh, really long quality time uh, looking at those mysterious pictures. And uh, I suppose it's not an issue for this audience, but usually if you uh, show uh, most of the astronomers a picture like this, um, people right away are asking, so what is on the axis? Uh, is it a sky map? Is it a core map? What is this? Uh, tell us how, how to understand these coordinates. And then you start to explain and that, no, this is uh, coordinates in the multidimensional parameter space uh, projected on the 2D space, blah, blah, blah. And everyone is looking at you like square eyes, what? Um, and the issue is that you can understand these maps, but you have to either have some good post labels. For example, uh, in this particular uh, paper, the authors used spectra itself, and they figured out that those clusters have actual meaning. So they tried to find O rich and C rich long periodic variables, and indeed they found uh, some rare cases, binaries, and so on. Uh, but if you don't have something to post label your data set, um, it becomes an issue. Uh, and this is a problem that can be in general solved if you have a good way to uh, analyze. So how exactly this parameter space projection was done? What kind of combination of the uh, features is resulting in this picture? But there are no tools uh, to do this just out of the uh, SkyKit uh, Python package to do it routinely. Um, so. And supervised machine learning algorithms are an issue, and uh, light curves are an even bigger issue. Uh, because unlike most of the data sets, uh, so when we uh, talk about uh, galaxy images, uh, well, galaxy people actually have it uh, very light. 
They have it perfect. They have uh, the same size of the cutouts. They have uh, more or less well-known noises, uh, systematics, uh, dark fields, everything. You can account for this. Now, um, for us, uh, people who work with light curves, we have uh, different sizes of the feature vectors. Uh, we have uh, uneven sampling. We have phase gaps. So essentially, if you determine a period and fold your light curve, you will have a huge gap in the most important part of the light curve, usually. Uh, then uh, there is um, period determination algorithms work um, differently for different types of objects. So you have to try an, a number of them. And then you will pinpoint a uh, peak uh, um, period as it actually reflects the cadence of your observations and not the physical nature of the object. So if uh, galaxy images uh, were uh, had the same issues, they would look more or less like this. Now, you won't uh, see it, but uh, there are actually a uh, systematic, so, um, I tried to uh, simulate uh, not only uh, the uneven sampling and uh, the lack of data points, but also uh, aliasing because there is a bit of a, a core, a systematic core difference in the center of the galaxy where the bulge is. So it will look much redder than it is. And uh, then there is uh, some systematic missing data on one of the spiral arms. Uh, where uh, uh, this is kind of an analogy for the phase gap. So the most important part of the galaxy, you don't see it. Uh, so um, this is how we deal with what the, the data we deal with. And uh, this is why uh, a lot of effort uh, before you can apply any machine learning algorithm to light curves, you usually have either pick one of the few algorithms that can take this uh, uneven and uh, various lengths feature vectors, or you have to do simulation or interpolation, for which also we have some uh, lovely, lovely, lovely algorithms. For example, uh, Gaussian processes that can result in uh, uh, produce you not only the predicted values between your observations, but also their uncertainties, but uh, which are computationally horrible because uh, the uh, naive implementation of this algorithm scales, I think, all uh, in order three, so some pretty pretty high computational load. So applying this kind of algorithm to the whole OSST data set isn't going to be feasible. So um, as a result, uh, yes, uh, we can apply unsupervised machine learning to white curves, but it is done rarely. Uh, but why would we want to do this? What kind of anomalies we want to find? What are the rare gems for this variability science? Now I put some uh, examples. Mostly um, I was biased towards uh, pulsating stars, but those are just examples. Now uh, we can also roughly divide uh, these potential rare gems into several categories. So the most uh, obvious one is uh, unknown unknowns. And in the last year, probably the most famous example is uh, Boyajan star, which no one expected to find, but we found it. And then all these um, hundreds of papers about uh, these are aliens. Um, but there are less uh, famous examples. For example, Blobs, pretty curious um, discovery. I think it was done on Cap. No, it was on Ogo, uh, which wasn't also predicted and was completely new kind of pulsating stars. Uh, then there are uh, known unknowns, which are, we don't know exactly what are they, but we kind of understand that uh, some classes of uh, objects are evolving from one stage to another. So in the middle, maybe there is some very rapid phase that we do not observe often because it's so rapid, but we know that it should exist. So we sort of know where to look. Uh, or maybe um, this is just some kind of um, hmm, rare class in, in the between of the um, objects. Uh, then there are objects uh, that are sort of fall in the common uh, category, but for some reason they are anomalous. They have, um, maybe they have unusual history. Um, rare but known uh, subtypes of objects. Uh, we know that they exist, but um, when we have uh, some crazy number of normal delta scutia, we have only some hundreds, 0.0. .0 5% of the total population of high amplitude delta scooters. And then there are um, ordinary objects in weird environment where they shouldn't have been formed. So if you look at them via traditional searching methods, uh, they will appear normal, but if you put them on the scale map or on some uh, core map, suddenly you are like, hey, what are you doing there? Um, and finally, there are ordinary objects with high value for um, hot topics of science. So supernova people will tell you more about this than I do, than I can. 
So um, fun fact is that most of the anomaly search uh, currently is done for these last two categories. And for these uh, categories, we usually do not uh, perform the search for them very well. And in fact, uh, all those discovery, I think one, some one or two papers here are uh, about discovery that is not serendipitous, but everything else we found it accidentally. So if you ask, uh, so what kind of uh, anomalies were found for the first time with unsupervised machine learning, not only in uh, variable sources science, but also in most of the other branches. I think I can remember one paper uh, about finding uh, a predicted known unknown uh, on the galaxy data set. But uh, if you ask, so how many anomalies were found with unsupervised machine learning, the answer is uh, pretty much zero. Uh, so question, uh, if we are going to have these millions of uh, light curves, how we are going to look for the uh, anomalies in these data sets? Now, I think that part of the issue is uh, sociological because actually most of the papers uh, about unsupervised machine learning, they usually have a this nice phrase in the end uh, that states, so this is the category of objects which are weird. We do not know what it is. It would be great to have follow-up observations, um, but then these follow-up observations are never done. Uh, and I would say that probably it is because uh, people who can and know how to do machine learning and people who can and do organize follow-up observation for this particular type of object, those two communities do not intersect very much. So the intersection is pretty small. So an advice for the future, if you are doing some unsupervised machine learning uh, anomaly search, don't look for the new fancy algorithms, don't look for um, weird uh, features, look for the right co-authors. This will give you more. Now, um, a bit of on the side. So in about six months, uh, I'm starting a new project uh, that is dedicated to slightly mitigate uh, this situation, uh, which is going to be uh, done in Slovenia on the SMASH Fellowship, uh, which is a MAPLC project. So essentially what I will try is I will try to take those common anomaly classes and I will try to take the existing data sets with features predator pre uh, made by LSST and by alert brokers, and also by made made by myself with machine learning tools. And I will try to figure out whether we can uh, reproduce the discovery using unsupervised machine learning approach, uh, just to figure out whether it's generally possible. And also uh, just for the fun of it, and because I'm a big fan of uh, making good visualization, uh, I'm planning to develop a better tool for visualizing uh, unsupervised machine learning, interactive one. So hopefully some kind of interpretability will get, will get better in a couple of years. So if you have a good anomaly case, or if you have some things about, uh, some thoughts about how to better visualize this kind of stuff in interpreted, please drop by and chat with me. And generally, as a conclusion, there are a set of uh, common issues that we need to deal with. Uh, and there is a set of things that we can do. Uh, so if you are an institution or a data facility, please invest in uh, having a good data infrastructure and especially in making an, op an opportunity to combine different data sets because this is where we can get uh, post labels for our unsupervised lo machine learning and just labels for supervised machine learning. And this is usually one of the hardest tasks to find the right data set and to combine it together. Uh, we are getting better at this, but still the facilities are not good enough for this kind of science. Secondly, uh, make good tutorials for your uh, facilities and for your code. And also the side note, if you are a supervisor as in lead by example and uh, document your code and write good uh, Jupyter notebooks. And if you are a student, uh, shake your supervisor and get some training on this subject. By the way, TVS LSST community is going to organize a workshop uh, in a few weeks, so please Keep an eye on the updates. We will um, give an announcement. And generally, we have to invest in better visualization in interpretation tools and get help from computer scientists. So if you are in some grant allocation committee and if you are in one of those projects that is bring together computer scientists and astronomers, this is a good uh, project for this kind of science. That's it. I think that my four slides took uh, more time than I expected. Thank you.